We then get into the very start of the battle. So we have this exchange of messengers. William is told about the movements of Harold's army and Harold is then informed about William's. In some ways, the battle in the Bay of Tapestry is shown as quite a simple operation in many respects. So we sort of see this gathering of lots and lots of troops and you can see all of the Normans on horseback here. In fact, at the Battle of Hastings, it's only one Anglo-Saxon on horseback, the rest of them are the Normans. It's worth mentioning here that Harold is still called King. That's really interesting because the Norman sources after the conquest and also William's context around William's own court really try to write out the idea that Harold was King. The Doomsday Book doesn't even refer to Harold's reign. We then get William interrogating one of his other messengers, Vitalis, and this is the third person that I've been sort of talking about, the characters that link us back to Odo as the commissioner of the tapestry. Vitalis is the third of these, but William interrogates him about the movements of Harold's army, and then we get Harold and the army coming into battle. So here's William giving potentially the only piece of reported speech on the tapestry inscription. So the tapestry inscription says that William speaks to his men, telling them to fight manfully and, and wisely. So viriliter et sapiente. This is a lovely point where William is clearly inspiring his troops, but there has been some suggestion that they're not really that interested in what he has to say. So we can see William talking to one, turning back towards looking at him, but the rest of them are already off and gone. But I think the importance here is that William is giving this speech to his men to rouse them and to go into fight. So essentially all we see now is the Norman army gradually charging, it would seem, towards the Anglo-Saxons. And what we know about the Battle of Hastings is that the Anglo-Saxons took the higher ground where Battle Abbey now is. They formed a shield wall. The Bay of Tapestry becomes more and more gruesome and you can see horses being falling over, men being chopped up, and now the lower border of the Bay of Tapestry is being littered with the Anglo-Saxon and Norman dead. And you sort of then see this second scene of the Anglo-Saxon shield wall, where the men are much more lightly armed, they don't have the same sort of armour as before, and they're standing on a hill. Essentially what happened is the Normans withdrew part of their army and the Anglo-Saxons, sensing that they were winning, would leave the higher ground after them, therefore exposing them to a sort of counter-attack. Bishop Odo, clearly shown here and named in the tapestry, is wielding a mace-like instrument, definitely some form of weapon. Does that mean he's fighting himself? Perhaps not. It could just mean that he's leading troops into battle and he's there to encourage the men. The text says that um, Odo rallies the young men, and in this scene it seems that there's knights going the other way, and the suggestion here is that this is one of the famed flights that we see in the Bay of Tapestry. And the response to that is immediate, so we see these raised swords, but then we see William raising his helmet. One of the things that is mentioned in the other written sources is that at this point, some sections of the assembled Norman army and other Northern French troops think that William is dead. The idea that your leader and the reason you were there fighting in the first place was dead would have sparked fear and would have been a confusing moment in the battle. He lifts his helmet up to show his men that he is there and that everything is okay. And you get next to him the standard bearer pointing at that, kind of, this is William, he's here, we're okay. Now the lower border is completely overwhelmed by these archers. A real kind of interlude of archers with their full quivers. And then almost immediately when we get back to the Saxon troops, you see the shields covered and studded in arrows. And we then get this sense that the battle is coming to an end and it's not looking good for the English. This is the, probably the bit that everybody knows in the Bayer Tapestry is the death of Harold. Now there's some sort of confusion here about which figure is Harold. There are three suggestions. So the first one, the way the name surrounding the standing figure, that's quite a classic trope that we've seen earlier in the tapestry to identify somebody as a named figure. This is Harold. 
But we have to remember that this part of the Bay of Tapestry has been extensively restored. And indeed, if we look at some of the earliest drawings of the Bay of Tapestry from the early 1700s, Harold does not have an arrow in his eye here. He's carrying, it seems, to be a spear or something sort of similar. When it then came to the early 19th century, by that point, this thing that is coming through his head, which potentially had a bit out the back that showed it was definitely a lance, not an arrow, has now actually gained little flights on the end, so it becomes a bit more like the arrow. Although, interestingly, the flights are very bunched close together there, whereas you can see the ones in the shield that Harold's holding are actually far further spaced apart, so again, sort of showing this kind of contrast between actually was it an arrow? Now, in the contemporary sources, the written sources at the time of the Battle of Hastings, they say that Harold was chopped up by various Norman knights on the battlefield. The tradition of being killed by an arrow in the eye doesn't start in the written sources until the 12th century. So the idea that this is an arrow through the eye is quite obviously a later construction, and I think here we can't use the tapestry as evidence that it was in fact the way he died in any sense, and that can firmly be put to rest, hopefully. So who else could Harold be? Well, if Harold isn't a standing figure, um, he could be the figure who's been cut down by the man on horseback. And that would align with some of the sources which say that parts of Harold's body was decapitated, limbs were cut off. Is that Harold? I mean, he's... We again don't really know because we don't have any identifying markers. And the third possibility is that they're both Harold. So we don't necessarily need to rule out the fact that the standing figure is Harold. He could have been hit with an arrow, he could have been standing up at the start of the scene, and then by the end he's been hacked down by a man on horseback. So it's hard to kind of decide exactly the way in which Harold died. So this is it. This is essentially almost how the Bayer Tapestry ends. But the last sort of scene in the Bayer Tapestry is Normans on horseback chasing the remnants of the Anglo-Saxon army from the battlefield. And then suddenly the Bayer Tapestry ends. The tapestry is destroyed at the end. We don't know if that ending actually survived. If it did, it was probably about three more metres. And we can kind of hypothesise what might have been included there. One of the key scenes that's discussed and possibly was on the, the ending, if not the very ending, would have been William's coronation. We don't know what might have come next, but one of the interesting things as well is that this is not a tapestry which is a record of the Norman Conquest. This is a tapestry which is a record of the preparations and invasion of England. Whether this was the real end or not, we'll never know for certain. Hi folks, I'm Dan Snyder, I'm on a History Hit TV adventure in Antarctica. You should subscribe because we've got a lot more of this kind of thing coming up, including digs on the former battlefields of the Western Front. As subscribers, you can use the code YouTube to get 50% off your first three months.